Yeah, I would first like to mention that I'm grateful for having the occasion of speaking the first time in my life at a QP error conference. Uh, certainly, I would have preferred to do this in the proper way, uh, standing in front of you, but um, what can you do? So, my name is Thomas Wetterlein, and I'm going to present joint work with uh, Jan Fasica. Now, I try to switch to my slides, and I hope that you can see them now. So, our topic is a rather traditional one. It's a topic about uh, a lot it has been written, and uh, many discussions uh, have been conducted. Uh, we are concerned with the reconstruction of the Hilbert space, in particular uh, the Hilbert space over the uh, complex numbers. Yeah. So our concern is uh, actually a quite demanding one. Um, we could say we uh, would like to have um, everything from nothing. Um, what we'd like to have is a um, structure, maybe an algebra, maybe a relational structure, maybe a category, which is uh, totally easy, easily definable and uh, really easily uh, understandable but yet leads straightforwardly to the complex Hilbert space as the standard model of uh, quantum physics. It might be a little bit less demanding to wonder what is actually the reason of the prominent role of linear spaces in mathematics. Uh, in particular, what's actually the deeper reason uh, for the fact that for representations of groups, usually complex spaces are used. Uh, what we deal here is um, basically the um, <clears throat> well-known logical algebraic approach to the conditional of quantum mechanics. And I would like to cite one of the classical results in this area, namely the great theorem of uh, Wilber, um, who characterized the complex Hilbert space by lattice theoretic means. So it looks uh, as follows. So uh, assume that you have a uh, an author lattice. The lattice with an author complementation and assume that the lattice is orthomodular, is um, atomic and appropriates the, the, the uh, covering property, is irreducible, complete, with infinite length, appropriates Popper's theorem and the square root axiom. But then what you get is exactly the infinite dimensional complex Hilbert space. So, although this is a great success and a really nice and deep result, there are certainly points of criticism. In particular, in the community of UPL, I think this criticism has been articulated in a rather loud way sometimes. Uh, the question is, I mean, why shouldn't we be satisfied and why shouldn't we just finish up this uh, topic? Um, uh, the point is, uh, orthomodular lattices as such are a very intuitive um, <coughs> structure. But if you go through all these axioms that I've just enumerated, then one should admit that some of these are quite technical and not so easily understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, if you consider construct constructions around linear spaces, one should admit that on the side of lattices, these constructions are not so easily emulated. Uh, finally, um, I am not really aware of uh, equally nice results uh, as rivers for the finite dimensional case. So all this gives us motivation to try one, one more way. Uh, this is actually not a new approach. Uh, namely, what we elaborate on is an idea of uh, David Paulus and his co co uh, collaborators who wrote the following questions. I mean, in practical, all these structures so that we consider in our field quantum structures, the orthogonality relation occurs. occurs. So um, the question is, I mean, how, how far uh, do we get only solely on the basis of orthogonality. I mean, the orthogonality relation does not really fulfill a lot. I mean, it is a symmetric and an irreflexive uh, binary relation, and that's it. And this leads to the notion coined by Paulus to an orthogonality space. It's a really weak structure and um, essentially an undirected graph. Yeah. The standard example certainly arises from the Hilbert space. So consider Hilbert space H and uh, consider the collection of one-dimensional subspaces of this Hilbert space. Uh, I'm very in this talk by P, P, P of H because this is simply the projective space. And uh, endow the projective space with the usual orthogonality relation, then what you get is certainly an orthogonality space. Yeah. 
Our first concern has been to characterizing exactly those alternative phases that arise from feedback spaces over the complex numbers. Mm -hmm. Uh, the method to do this leads us straightforwardly back to the uh, approach just mentioned to the uh, to, to lattice theory, uh, namely an orthogonality space uh, with an orthogonality space we may easily associate in ortho lattice. Um, take a subset of the orthogonality space, then um, <coughs> uh, the simple perp stands for the orthogonal complement, set of all elements that are orthogonal to all elements of this subset A. Then the double perp gives the closure operator, and the system of closed sets of all orthogonality space uh, is in complete orthogonality. It is not the case that you might identify one to one uh, these lattices with the orthogonality space but to a sufficient extent uh, that we can work actually here in a uh, lattice theory. In what follows, we will focus exclusively on the case of finite rank. That means we deal just with case of finite dimensional spaces. Um, this decision actually was made also under the influence of uh, this very conference. And one should mention that in the infra-dimensional case, certain things are easier rather than more. Difficult. Now, the question is what characterizes um, orthogonality spaces arising from linear spaces? Uh, we call an orthogonality space linear if the following property holds. Uh, consider two distinct elements. So, for these distinct elements, there's a third element, distinct elements are E and F, so there's a third element G, such that the set of um, elements orthogonal to E and F is the same as those that are orthogonal to E and G which is the same as to say that the closure of E and F uh, equals the closure of E and G. And exactly one of F and G is orthogonal to E. So that means if um, E and F are not orthogonal, there's a third element G, which is orthogonal to E. And E and F and E and G uh, <coughs> lead to the same um, <coughs> closed uh, uh, subset. And if F and G are orthogonal, then in uh, the uh, if E and F are orthogonal, then in the closure of E and F there's a third element. So this uh, condition is sufficient to lead us to uh, linear spaces or more precisely to Hermitian spaces. So Hermitian space is a linear space over some uh, school field division ring uh, with a individual automorphism and um, together with the Hermitian form, uh, which is a symmetric in isotropic sesquilinear form. Mm -hmm. We have the following theorem, I mean, from um, Hermitian space, we are nearly trivially led to, an author, to a linear orthogonality space, but also the converse holds. So consider a linear orthogonality space that has a finite rank and at least four. Then this orthogonality space arises from a Hermitian space and the division ring is determined uh, up to isomorphism uh, uniquely. Um, uh, the dimensional uh, uh, anyhow. So we, in this talk, do not want to go further uh, towards the question how to characterize exactly the complex Hilbert spaces. So that means um, mm, uh, these particular Hilbert Hermitian spaces in which we are actually interested in. Uh, the topic of this talk is a different one. Uh, we wonder how we can organize orthogonality spaces into a category. Uh, so that means um, we are concerned with the question how to define reasonably morphisms. It's uh, certainly clear that uh, uh, morphism should be a homomorphism of orthogonality spaces, meaning that a morphism should preserve the orthogonality relation. But what we want to have are morphisms which, when applied to linear orthogonality spaces, are in a reasonable correspondence with uh, Hermitian spaces. That means uh, somehow describable by maps that preserve, in some sense, linear dependence. What do we have on the side of Hermitian spaces? Hermitian spaces, we first of all, of course, have the linear maps, uh, which might or might not preserve, in addition, some inner product. Um, a little bit more general, we have semi linear maps, yeah, prominent in projective geometry. And even more general, we have what is called uh, generalized uh, semi linear uh, maps. 
and um, it's the latter that plays for us the, the main role. However, if the, if the situation is as, is as follows, when considering automorphisms of the orthogonality spaces, the situation is quite pleasant. And we have a weakness theorem. Um, a bijection of a medium space is called semi-unitary if it is additive, um, semi-linear, uh, which means that there's some automorphism of the field, um, and if you pull out some, some, some constant factor, then these automorphism applies. And uh, the uh, inner product is preserved up to this automorphism and the, and the factor. Mm -hmm. And by the theorem of Wigner and the version of Piron or Uhlhorn, uh, whatever you like, you have a nice correspondence between the automorphisms of the orthogonality space arising from some Hermitian space on the one hand, and the semi-unitary operators on this Hermitian space on the other hand. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the situation is not the same when you consider homomorphisms. In this case, Wigner certainly does not apply. And to il illustrate the difficulties, um, consider the following case. So consider the three-dimensional complex space on the one hand, and consider a um, continuously dimensional complex space on the other hand. And you may define some map from the projective space associated with the format with the projective space associated with, with, the, with the letter. Uh, such that the image consists only of uh, mutually orthogonal elements. In this case, certainly orthogonality is preserved, but there is not even one triple of um, one-dimensional subspaces whose linear dependence is, is preserved. So we have to think uh, the situation over, and what we have uh, decided is uh, to consider not orthogonality spaces in their, in their full generality, but more special objects. Uh, what's relevant about the uh, letters of uh, subspaces in the uh, Hilbert space? The Boolean subalgebras. Boolean subalgebras correspond to observables, and so it makes sense to require a reasonable behavior of um, Boolean subalgebras also in the case of our orthogonality spaces. We call an orthogonality space normal if the following holds. Uh, consider mutually orthogonal elements uh, within the Author letters of closed subspace of our orthogonality space, we want that the closure of these orthogonal elements, uh, taking single terms, yeah, the, these, uh, these elements, uh, that they generate a um, Boolean algebra. I mean, this is a property which certainly does not refer directly to the orthogonality space, but it's possible to formulate it in an alternative way, namely, if you have a maximum set of uh, mutually orthogonal elements. And have an element that is orthogonal to a subset of these uh, elements and another one that is orthogonal to the remaining ones, then these two should be orthogonal. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, um, AC spaces, which are those orthogonality spaces uh, as I said, leading to, to orthomodular uh, lattices are normal, but the converse does not hold. Uh, for normal orthogonality spaces, it does make sense to require a morphism to fulfill further properties, not only the preservation of the orthogonality relation. Mm -hmm. Namely, consider the Boolean algebra that is generated by our um, closure of uh, single terms, uh, then we require normal homomorphisms to preserve uh, these uh, Boolean substructures. Uh, roughly speaking, we may say that no normality for homomorphisms between orthogonality spaces means that Boolean substructures are mapped again to Boolean substructures. Uh, we are to a uh, category consisting of normal orthogonality spaces and normal homomorphisms. And uh, we get a full subcategory consisting of the linear orthogonality spaces. What do we have on the side of um, projective geometry? On the side of projective geometry, also um, lots, lots of work has been done concerning category. Uh, first I mentioned the monograph by Florian and Fröhlicher, and there's also a very detailed lengthy article by Stephen von Sperger. Um, the problem here is that the morphisms considered in this context are too special for us. Mm -hmm. uh, what we deal here is, what we need here are so-called lineations. So a lineation between projective spaces is a map that preserves the um, linear dependence. So that means if three one-dimensional subspaces are linear dependent, which is indicated by the L here, then the same applies to the images. The lineation is called degenerate, non-degenerate, if the image is not contained in the two-dimensional subspace. 
And if the image of a line is never only two elements. And uh, now with the notion of a lineation, we get what we want. So the morphisms in uh, our category of a linear orthogonality spaces are exactly the orthogonality we preserve in lineations. Our question now is how can we represent, how can we de describe the orthogonality preserving lineations? And here the situation is uh, quite complicated. Uh, namely, lineations are not described by semilinear maps, but what is called generalized similar, similar, semilinear maps. For reasons of time, I'll skip the details and just mention that we no longer deal with the homomorphisms between the uh, associated fields, between the scalar fields, but what is called a place. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, it was proved by uh, Machala, uh, Corre, and uh, many people also worked on this field uh, that um, the lineations are um, described uh, appropriately by generalized semilinear maps with uh, one restriction, not really the, the lineations, lineations in general, but the non degenerate ones. So I just defined. Yeah? In our case, we deal with the, also with the preservation of uh, orthogonality. So what we want is um, some reasonable behavior with respect to the inner product. Um, so we are led to generalized semi-unitary maps in the same way as we are led to semi-unitary maps. Um, now the question when we when a generalized semi-linear map that preserves an orthogonality relation is actually a generalized semi-unitary map is quite difficult, and we could answer the, um, the, the question if uh, we get such a semi-unitary map uh, only under um, particular uh, circumstances, namely if our Hermitian spaces are over commutative school fields, or that is over fields, and if there's a basis that consists of vectors of equal length, then a non-degenerate orthogonality preserved delineation is induced by a generalized uh, semi-unitary map. The question is now when, when is a um, delineation non-degenerate? And in our case, uh, we have that Morphism in our category loss automatically fulfills L1, the, the first condition under the very, very um, high condition that the dimension must be at least three, so this is no problem. But the other condition uh, that the image of a line should not consist of two elements is more tricky. Mm -hmm. um, if this uh, condition fails, then we have that in uh, our Hermitian space, there's a three dimensional subspace with the two varied measure. And um, we consider the question, I mean, when can we exclude the existence of uh, two varied measures in, uh, in, in, in a three-dimensional Hamiltian space? And we um, <coughs> try to adapt the proof of uh, um, the Giesen theorem uh, to this end and succeeded to do so under additional uh, conditions, namely, if we deal with an order field that is Euclidean, meaning that every positive element has a, element has a square, and if this uh, Euclidean field is uh, embedded into the wheels, then we can exclude the existence of two value measures. And this means that we get as follows to our final uh, result. If we consider once again a subcategory of our category of normal orthogonality spaces consisting only of those orthogonality spaces that arise from finite dimensional <coughs> um, positive definite spaces. Uh, dimension at least three over Euclidean subfields of the wheels. <coughs> then we can uh, provide a reasonable des description of um, the morphisms, namely they are all represented by generalized semi-unitary maps. So this is the theorem with which I would like to close. My time is uh, actually practically over. It just to complete shortly what we have seen. First of all, to characterize the Hamiltonian spaces as orthogonality spaces is possible by a um, quite uh, transparent uh, commentatory uh, Condition. Um, the aim to make the orthogonality space into category in a, in a way that on the side of uh, linear orthogonality spaces we get something that is related to the preservation of linear dependence is, has been turned out to be a tricky question, and we will reach to the notion of normal orthogonality spaces. Uh, in, in this way, we get a more reasonable notion of, um, um, <coughs> of a, a morphism in a way uh, that. Uh, that the morphisms are um, um, corresponding to orthogonality preserved line lineations, and the latter are under additional assumptions representable by generalized semi-unitary maps. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for your interest. If there will be questions, I will be happy to answer them if I'm able to. <laughs>